Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kat Zagaria Buckley, and I'm the Director of Art um, Exhibitions and Outreach here at the University of Southern Maine in our art gallery. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you to tonight's virtual curatorial lecture on our current exhibition, Hope Under Pressure. The exhibition is on at our art gallery and our Glickman Library, and I hope that you'll have a chance to stop by if you haven't already done so. Tonight, we will be talking with the exhibition's artist curators, Rennie Gower and Melissa Potter. Rennie incorporates sacred geometry in her spray pelt paintings and paper cuts to reveal universal cross-cultural connections. Her artwork is represented in many prestigious collections and has been exhibited at international and national venues for over 40 years. In addition to her painting practice, Gower curates award-winning traveling exhibitions. After 37 years, Professor Emerita Gower retired from Virginia Commonwealth University in December 2018. She holds an MFA from Syracuse University, an MA from the University of Minnesota Duluth, and a BS with honors from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Melissa Potter is a multimedia artist, curator, writer, and a professor of art at Columbia College Chicago. She is the recipient of three Fulbright Fellowships to Serbia and the regions of Bosnia and Herzegovina with residencies through ArtsLink and the Trust for Mutual Understanding. Her work has been shown internationally and her essays have been published in BOM, Art Papers, and Flash Art. Her curatorial project, Social Paper, Hand Paper Making in the Context of Socially Engaged Art, examined hand paper making as socially engaged art. She holds an MFA from Rutgers University and a BFA from Virginia Commonwealth University. With that, I hope that you will enjoy our curatorial lecture and I welcome Melissa and Rennie to take it away. Thank you so much. Here I will, are we, are we in good shape? I think so, so Thank anyway. You. Um, good evening. Um, we are really delighted to be here with you this evening to talk about Pulp Under Pressure, the Art of Handmade Paper. As Kat said, it's actually very interesting that it's installed at two different venues affiliated with um, the University of Southern Maine, and it's interesting to see how we were able to sort of divide and conquer for that. Um, I, as she said, I co-curated this project with Melissa Hillier Potter, and um, Melissa is in Chicago at Columbia College Chicago. So we want to give a uh, very special thanks to Kat Zagaria Buckley for her incredible work on this exhibition, who helped us bring it together in this uh, unusual um, dual venue situation. Thank you so much. Yeah. So tonight we're gonna to present some historical background about the art of handmade paper. And we'll also give you a virtual tour of the exhibition along with some of the backstory of, about the artists and the art in the show. And then we'll end the conversation sharing a few more examples of contemporary artworks made of handmade paper by artists that are not represented in the exhibition. So um, as she said, um, in addition to a long teaching and studio practice, I started curating traveling exhibitions about 20 years ago and um, Pulped Under Pressure was my 10th project. Melissa has been invested in the art of handmade paper for over 25 years from the Dieu Donné paper mill in New York City to the Center for Book, Paper and Print at Columbia College Chicago. Her path has also taken her to Bosnia and Serbia as a Fulbright scholar, where she built two studios and taught a generation of young artists about hand paper making. So you may be wondering, how did Rennie and I come together? Um, Rennie and I first met while I was a student of painting and printmaking at Virginia Commonwealth University. And since that time, we have continued to collaborate, which is now over 20 years. Uh, we work together on many artist advocacy projects, including Meta Mentors and Art Happens at the College Art Association's annual conference. And we also have a new curatorial project collaboration called The Garden. Um, in October 2014, I invited Rennie to be an artist in residence at the Columbia College Chicago Center for Book and Paper. This was in conjunction with an exhibition she had called Paper Cuts, um, which was at the Glass Curtain Gallery at Columbia College Chicago. So at that time, I had the pleasure of exploring my work from an entirely new perspective through the art of handmade paper. And during this time, I met and I worked with several other artists 
who subsequently became part of Pulped Under Pressure. As it turned out, each artist in Pulped Under Pressure has had a rewarding artistic affiliation with the Center for Book, Paper, and Print at Columbia College Chicago. And I was so delighted with the results of my residency, I proposed an exhibition of works to a regional center in Virginia. Because they also wanted to host a, a book arts exhibition, I asked if I could curate something special for them. And since Melissa was agreeable to working with me, the pilot project was envisioned and shown at the Visual Arts Center in Northbrook in the spring of 2016. So it took approximately a year to adapt uh, the exhibition to travel to multiple venues over an eight year period. I still cannot believe it's been eight years. Um, in the spring of 2017, it launched again at the Monmouth <coughs> Museum of Art in Lincroft, New Jersey. With traditional hand paper making at its core, pulped under pressure underscores important contemporary issues steeped in history and craft. Enticed through touch, these works encourage a contemplative slowing down, even as they urge acknowledgement of some of the most pressing issues today, including environmental crisis and global marginalization. Each of the artists, Jillian Bouchera, Julia Goodman, Rennie Gower, Trisha Martin, myself, Marilyn Propp, and Maggie Puckett, starts simply with the foundation of pulp made from natural fibers. Our multifaceted results incorporate a rich range of printmaking, letterpress, paper cutting, and installation. So in very unique ways, we all consider paper beyond its most common function as a passive surface of record or as a purely craft medium. Instead, the material is transformed and embedded with content that turns communication into a public practice. By challenging assumptions, the artists of Pulped Under Pressure create artworks that are both beautiful and brave. So by way of some history, in ancient times, writings and inscriptions were generally made on tablets of bamboo or clay, which were heavily, uh, which were heavy or on pieces of papyrus or silk, which were expensive. Beginning in China and going back over 1500 years, an inventor, Chai Lun from the Han Dynasty, is credited with the invention of paper that used mulberry and other bast fibers that were combined with fishnets, old rags, and hemp waste. While his exact formula has been lost, legend suggests that Tsai was inspired by watching paper wasps build their nest. By the third century, paper had become the most economical and widely used writing medium in China. As such, paper accelerated literacy and advanced civilization at a pace much faster than ever before. While the tools and machinery of papermaking in modern times may be more complex than those illustrated here, they still employ the ancient techniques of fiber suspended in water, strong hydrogen bonds on tiny fiber fibrils activated by, on, by ionic charges between the water and the fiber, draining of the water, and then drying the fibers into a thin matted sheet. So by the seventh century, China's papermaking technique had spread throughout Asia, and subsequently into the Islamic world during the 8th century. At this point, the papermaking process was transformed from an art actually into an industry. Muslims refined the process and designed machinery for bulk manufacturing that could produce thicker sheets. And the earliest water-powered mills for producing paper pulp date back to this time period. Unlike the Chinese, however, the Muslims employed linen as a substitute for the bark of the mulberry tree. Linen rags were disintegrated, saturated with water, and made to ferment. Boiling helped to clear the alkaline residue and the dirt from the rags before they were beaten or macerated to a pulp using hammers. Many paper mills were built in Baghdad and Damascus and were the major supply source to Europe and other parts of the world. When paper was first introduced to Europe in the 12th century, it gradually revolutionized the manner in which written communication could be spread from region to region. Scholarly exchange between the East and the West was fostered by the Crusades and the widespread use of paper facilitated the foundation of the scholastic age in medieval Europe. So from 1300 to about 1800, the European papermaking process was a time of intensive intensive process that required highly skilled labor. A source for clean water, free of iron and debris, was extremely important. Often a nearby stream would provide the top quality water, whereas a river would provide the power. 
Sorting rags into similar weights and colors and quality required great skill and experience. So skills young girls learn from their mothers and other relatives. And because rags with varying degrees of strength and wear reacted in different ways to the redding or the fermentation process and determined the final quality of the batch, rough, dirty fibers such as ropes and old sails and canvas actually needed to be separated from the rags of a finer quality. Hemp and flax fiber were the dominant fibers. Cotton was rare in paper before 1800. Before the Hollander beater became widely used, fermentation of the rag was a key step in the process to make the paper uniform, for it to bind, to be soft, and to give it weight. Fermenting was the job of a specialist similar to that of a wine steward. Cooking and bleaching are the modern substitutions for fermentation. Cutting, beating, and washing the rags into small fibers occur using stampers with hammers. The constant washing throughout this process lightened the color of the cleansed fibers of the microbes and impurities that could promote mold. To be ready for sheet forming, the pulp had to be homogeneous as milk and the consistency of buttermilk. So they would use a sieve-like mold fitted with open wooden frame called a decal. The vatman would dip the mold into the vat of pulp. And while pulling up, he would shake it gently to distribute the pulp e evenly, and then also to rebind the fibers. He would remove the decal and, and hand the mold to the kutcher, who would flip the mold upside down and press it against a damp, damp woolen felt to transfer the sheet to the felt. The paper was converted, <clears throat> was covered with another felt and the process continued. The layer worked to separate the damp paper from the felts after they were pressed to remove the excess moisture. This also took a great deal of skill to avoid tearing the sheets. Pressing also increased the smoothness of the sheet's surface. After pressing, the paper was taken to a loft to dry. So slow drying was essential to minimize the puckering or the wrinkles and creases called cockling. A final addition of gelatin sizing was added to the paper to make it supple or pliant and durable. And a finisher might glaze the paper using a smooth stone to create the final smooth surface. It's pretty labor intensive. <laughs> what I think what, what's about? incredible to me is that, you know, the most ubiquitous material in the world, I still, after all these years, um, am reminded of these complex histories. So thanks for taking the time to, you know, really muse through this with, uh, with me. As demand through pay, for paper continued into the Industrial Revolution, rags were no longer a realistic way to produce pulp. By the 19th century, with the development of the Fordner machine, modern papermaking was capable of producing a continuous roll of paper rather than individual sheets. Independently, the Canadian Charles Fennerty and the German Frederick Keller uh, invented processes for making paper out of wood pulp, which is newsprint, uh, which ended nearly 2,000 years of using pulped rags for paper. Today, almost all paper is made out of pulped wood. So at the turn of the 20th century, a renewed interest in handicrafts reflected the idealism of designers and artists and thinkers like William Morris and the Roycrofters. In a direct response to the mechanization of industrialization, these practitioners believed in the transformative nature of handwork, which continues today in what is often described as a DIY aesthetic. The rise of technologies then, as they do now, always invoke a return to the haptic and the handheld. Like many crafts, including clay, glass, and fiber, interest in hand paper making has had an artistic medium started in earnest in the early 1970s. Collaborative studios like the Dune created spaces where the medium could be explored in many incarnations, such as fine art additioning to micro industry initiatives. These institutions are now international treasures that create diverse contemporary works in what was once a utility based traditional craft. Educational institutions and craft schools followed suit with programs highlighting hand papermaking and its relationship to book paper and print. In the few decades since, they have populated the contemporary art and crafts world with generations of paper-based artists interested in the ways in which the medium offers a distinctive voice. Its labor-intensive process encourages collaboration, and so quite naturally, community-based interactive projects abound. Its scientific processes also encourage artists to study its inherent biology and technology through its relationship to farming and plant stewardship. 
For all paper practitioners, it's infinitely mercurial nature, which often changes by climate, studio location, and time of year, is part of hand paper making's challenge and appeal. <laughs> So whether directly or metaphorically, there are many themes woven into and between the works of Pulped Under Pressure. Through interdisciplinary practices, these artists strive to offset environmental destruction and global warming through educational initiatives that promote the preservation of natural habitats and the reclamation of discarded materials. They also seek ways to balance a technology media driven consumerist culture with a more contemplative and slower paced how that spiritual or inclusive interaction with the world. So in doing, they restore cultural histories by recognizing marginalized communities and the universal codes embedded in the individual. Most importantly, these artists expand an autobiographic narrative into a cultural critique that fosters collaboration and community engagement. California native Jillian Bruchera is an interdisciplinary artist and arts act, uh, art activist who creates works in visual art, writing, public installation, body performance, and social practice. She puts a lot of things in handmade paper, including her own body. Recently, she has been embedding obsolete technology inside paper sculptures. If you look closely, you will find subtle bits of tech in the bricks of the waste made wall sculpture. She wonders where all of these objects, television, remotes, CDs, Walkmans, home phones, etc., will end up when they're no longer needed. More specifically, she wonders how can we avoid the landfill? She prefers to make paper out of waste because she's a big believer in waste not, want not. Her mantra, work with what you've got, has her using junk mail, egg cartons, old cotton t-shirts, ripped denim jeans. She gives a new life to materials that have a one-time use before they are discarded. Cardboard is a great example. This material is literally everywhere in the alleyways of any major metropolitan city. It's free and it makes for a great batch of pulp. If she's not putting things in paper, she's putting paper in things. So for instance, she has filled sidewalk cracks with paper, she's pressed pulp directly onto brick walls, and she's implanted paper artworks into drywall. She puts things in places they're not supposed to be to challenge people to see things in a new way. She is largely influenced by the global lesbian and gay liberation movements. It's her conceptual concerns revolve around sexual identity, politics, and the preservation of a subvocal queer history. She believes in art making's transformative power to hold life, to spark conversations, to heal the human spirit. As such, she uses her own lesbian narrative to transcend social adversities and to generate solidarity. For her, art bears witness to her internal self and is made for what can't be said. Nonetheless, she often uses wordplay to divest words of their specificity and their authority. So looking more closely at the rules of grammar, the viewer will discover small inclusions of actual dictionary definitions for words that have been used to describe queer bodies words like lesbian, gay, homosexual. These definitions were scanned from dictionary pages of the last century, and it's interesting to note that the definitions have all changed over time. Her works, Rules of Grammar, question what is or what should be by substituting what can be. Julia Goodman is an independent artist based in Berkeley, California. Her interdisciplinary work stem from her ongoing projects making cast paper from discarded bed sheets and papyrus from beets. Many of Julia's works are loosely based on the history of rag paper and the moments between 1666 and 1964 when paper making overlapped with a scarcity of rags for making paper pulp. This timeline determines her titles and dates the materials used to make the pulp and the materials used to make the molds the pulp is cast into. The handmade paperworks included in this show are part of a larger body of work made in residence at Recology San Francisco, The Dump. This series looks at the relationship women have had with rag paper over the centuries. Women employed at Recology San Francisco, then known as Sanitary Fill Company, sorted rags until 1964. Barrels of rags collected by garbage men were taken to the Bayshore building where fabrics were sorted by a group of women who were all over 50 and of Italian descent. In 2012, Julia attended an artist residency at Recology where artists work with materials recovered from the city's waste flow. 
During this time, she also conducted interviews with former employers of the sanitary fill company who were able to recall seven names of the rag sorters, which can be seen cast here in each piece. Rita Bianchi, Emma Muzio, Maria Tringale, Olga Vera, and Giuseppina Calgari, Alda Campi, and Josephine Grosso. The seven cast panels venerate these women. Rita Bianchi's name was recreated to be, uh, based on font and design of the 1942 Metropolitan Opera House bill that was also scavenged from the dump. Creating this piece was an opportunity to recontextualize the aesthetics of a high cultural event by making an invisible low level, level labor visible again. So she also partners with farmers who grow a, a wide variety of beets, and she uses the bold colors and the diverse symmetries that exist underground to create intensely colored skin-like abstractions that are unmanicured and imperfect with veins and hair. Irregular shapes are caused by the challenges and the circumstances of the growth. As the papyrus ages, the brightest colors fade over time. Through the root vegetable's incredible staining powers, the stage stages of the papyrus making become visible again. So a delicate archive is an ongoing series of smaller scale pieces and stains made with the beets. The components of the archive are sensitive to light and oxygen, as such the colors do fade with time. The cycle of aging is built into this project. The individual components of the archive will not be restored, but the archive can be added to with new pieces every year. The animation and the book Earth Signs Traveling in the Exhibition were actually created with works from a delicate archive um, that stained the bed sheets while they were drying. By incorporating sacred geometry, Rennie's work reveals cross-cultural connections. Since ancient times, geometric perfection, circle, square, and triangle has been thought to convey sacred and universal truths by reflecting the fractal interconnections of the natural world. One finds these similarities across cultures embedded in many diverse ethnic patterns. Incorporating these patterns into works of art promotes access through recognition. So uh, this commonality creates connections that encourage understanding. In these works, the patterns are based upon Celtic knotwork designs and Islamic tile motifs. For the paper cuts, the patterns are traced and hand cut into interlocking uh, <clears throat> motifs and um, the paint, the paper is painted on the back to reflect the color back through the pristine white of the front. In the pulp paintings, the same stencils are used to block the spray pulped on the hand pulled paper ground. So using only a snap blade or a spray bottle, I celebrate the redemptive nuance of slow work made by hand and create these pristine works that hopefully counter visual skimming and slow you down. Tricia Orly Martin is a teaching artist living and working in San Diego, California. She was one of Rennie's assistants during her first visit to Columbia College, Chicago. Tricia is inspired by her rich cultural heritage and its philosophy that all humankind in tandem with the visible and invisible world are one. Keeping in mind that the world is quickly a quickly deteriorating place, she challenges her audience to look outside of themselves and act as a community that can learn from one another. Her highly patterned works are pulped and printed with native Filipino designs that reflect this holistic worldview. Like Jillian, Trisha envisions her art as a creative catalyst that can convey important information. This piece was created as the centerpiece of the 27, in, uh, 27 foot wall at the Visual Arts Center in mind. As pulped under pressure travels, it continues to be our showstopper with <laughs> outlines of centipedes, Trees and snakes or basic geometric patterns such as diamonds and squares. The simple designs are evocative of the mountainous region of the Cordilleros. Trisha has the good for, had the good fortune to meet Wang Agai, who was 99 years old at the time she met her and is considered the last Filipina tribal tattooist. With disinterest from young Filipinos, this 500 year old tradition is slowly dying out because the tattoo techniques can only be practiced or passed on through rel related family members of the practitioner. As such, Trisha has created an alternative way to archive and save this practice from obscurity. The designs now appear in pattern block prints on handmade paper, often arranged in multi-sheet compositions as seen in this piece, Textures of the Philippines.
So her art making activities are often interactive or have performative components and her focus on participatory projects shares an ethos encapsulated by the Tagalog term kwapa, or kapwa, often translated as togetherness or fellow being. In a mutually beneficial exchange over a month in 2011, Martin worked with Hadin Kalakazan, a, a self-reliant woman's papermaking cooperative in the Filipino province of Quezon, whose members harvest and process into paper, abaca, kogan grass, paper mulberry, and coconut husks, also making natural dyes from tree barks and turmeric. I'm a multimedia artist, curator, and writer, and I love to collaborate <laughs> um, conceptually, the juxtaposition of technology and handcrafted elements are also evident in this series called Craft Power to Shetty Rugs. This is a series of hand, uh, flax handmade paper with laminated L wires that illuminate when plugged in. Through a collaborative research project called Handmade Media, Paul Catanese and I explored the intersection of handcrafted media with handmade paper. These pieces were inspired by the craft symbol system in the Republic of Georgia, where it's understood some of the images may be derived from ancient Amazonian cults celebrating female power. I learned about these images while I was working with groups of felt artisans in the Republic of Georgia in 2013. So Marilyn Propp recently moved from Chicago, from Chicago to Kenosha, Wisconsin with her husband, David Jones. She's the co-founder of Anchor Graphics, now Anchor Press Paper and Print Milwaukee. Marilyn works in many mediums that include painting, printmaking, sculpture, and paper. After the 2010 BP Gulf oil spill, her previously playful animated machine parts became much more ominous. Her research in marine life and aquatic ecosystems evolved into a series of circular sectional paintings entitled Notes from the Sea. These works reflect the clash and the coexistence between the industrial and the natural world. In her paintings, irregular shaped panels fit together like puzzles to form circles. Like, like myself, she uses the circle to address issues of interdependence and interconnectedness. In her prints, she repeats this format in large circular, circular woodcuts that reference the machine parts, personal objects, and the sea turtle that moves through this watery confluence of mutated forms. She also collects metal um, dietary metal junk to construct large sentinel pieces out of metal and wood as well as small constructions built from found objects. The pulp paper works in this exhibition are an out outgrowth of all of these investigations. In Notes from the Sea, industrial debris, machine parts, and marine life are entangled or morph into one another. This work is fueled by her ongoing concerns about destructive environmental practices that destroy coral reefs, creating floating islands of plastic or spawn oil spills. She combines the materiality of handmade paper and printmaking with a luminous color palette to offer images of beauty that address destruction. As an ancient symbol of creativity, longevity, endurance, and persistence, the sea turtle is a sublime emblem. Given their ability to travel great distances and adapt to obstacles generated by climate change, exploitation, and habitat loss, they are ideal, an ideal contemporary medium as well. In this series, the medium of handmade paper reflects both the undersea world and the way paper itself is made. As a watery material, the wet pulp is stirred, formed, drained, and pressed. To create simplified marks that, su that suggest the movement of sea, the artist drags her gloved stained fingers through the water. Likewise, pigmented pulp is pushed through a grid to fashion a textured surface similar to fish scales or cellular plant forms. To enhance the impression of an underwater glimpse, the prints are installed unframed floating off the wall. With their irregular decals, the works evoke the movement of sea life and suggest filtered sunlight as though looking up through the water from below. So Maggie Puckett is an interdisciplinary artist living in Chicago. She was also one of my assistants during my first visit to Columbia College Chicago. Maggie uh, makes hybrid works by combining handmade paper, artist books, and printmaking techniques with social media and environmental activism. She has an ongoing series based upon the Anthropocene, which is a current geological period where in human activities have a powerful effect on the global environment. This series combines art and science to explore the complicated history and future of the Anthropocene 
anthropogenic effects on the Earth's systems. Through handmade paper and artist books, the selected projects navigate our fragile planet from atmosphere to bedrock, examining ecological history and visualizing um, predictions of future global change. Through this project, she is trying to change ecological consciousness. In her piece, Psyche Anthropocene Projection, Puckett uses the seductive tactility of handmade paper in concert with rich organic color to project the dire effects of climate change that she and others pessimistically predict for our future. As a collaborative initiative, Seeds in Service explores the fertile intersection of the art of hand paper making with gardening, social practice, community engagement, and creative pedagogy, as well as individual artistic practice. Maggie Puckett and I combine hand paper making projects with heirloom plants, originally sourced from the Hull House Heirloom Seed Library and grown in the paper maker's garden at Columbia College, Chicago. These homegrown paper making plant fibers are pulped, pulled, painted, sculpted, and letter pressed into seed packets, menu cards, tablecloths, and activist posters, among other objects, which are printed with fragments of feminist literature and distributed to seed banks, individual gardeners, and as messages in public performances such as the Women's March in 2017. In essence, the Seeds and Service Garden cultivates future generations of eco gardeners and art activists. So in Maggie's Big Here series, the audience is invited to participate by drawing and writing their responses to questions that she poses about the local environment. And then she later transforms these handmade paper sheets into the pages of sculptural books. Um, through these types of informed interactions, Puckett hopes to trigger greater awareness about environmental issues that will in turn prompt socially engaged actions that start at the local but impact the global. Rennie usually works alone in her Virginia studio. The opportunity to collaborate with other artists in Columbia College Chicago Center for Book, Paper and Print was an exceptional experience that ultimately launched other fruitful investigations using the stencils she created for the pulp paintings. Along with Maggie, I was intimately involved in the creation and cultivation of the paper maker's garden at Columbia College Chicago. While generating homegrown fiber for our paper making projects, the garden was also the site for collaborative, educational and advocacy events between artists and the public. So sourcing materials from farmers and recycling found farmers from the dump are integrated into Julia's practice. And much of Maggie's studio time is organized around gardening and the four seasons, spring plantings, summer and fall harvesting, and the drying in the winter studio production. Next slide. Yeah, I know. I'm just like, wait a minute. Oh, there we go. Jillian created and travels with a mobile papermaking workshop called the Mobile Mill, which is back on the road um, this year in California. On the road, the artist often camps and sets up her studio anywhere at festivals, schools, in the woods, on a beach. In addition to working with handmade paper, Marilyn explores many mediums in a more traditional studio setting. Trisha combined her interest in historical Filipino designs and artifacts with research at the Chicago Field Museum, where she initiated a monthly series that evolved a process of co-curation and dialogue about the selected objects with community members. So um, to conclude, we're going to share a few examples of a range of handmade paper works created by other contemporary artists. Most, I think, will recognize the signature work of the American artist Chuck Close who first achieved fame as a photorealist painter through his massive sized portraits. After a catastrophic spinal artery collapse left him severely paralyzed in 1988, he was forced to adapt his painting techniques with brushes strapped to his arms. Also suffering from face blindness, Painting portraits helped him cope with this additional disability. The pulp paper collage Georgia was produced at the Pace Paper Studios in Brooklyn. New York artist Arlene Sheckett likens her studio to both a farm and a factory. She employs an experimental approach to ceramic sculpture by testing the limits of gravity, color, and texture, and by pushing against the boundary of classical techniques. She sometimes fuses her kiln-fired creations with complex plinths formed of wood, steel, and concrete. These multi-dimensional paper-based works began in the ceramic studio. Casting molds were created from her, uh, from her sculptures, fire bricks, and drawings in clay, and then used to give form to paper. 
In a reciprocal relationship with her ceramic practice, she works with vividly colored paper pulp as if it were a ceramic glaze and works with glaze as if it were paint. So the Black American artist Melvin Edwards was born in Houston, Texas and grew up in the segregated South. After a 30 year teaching career, he retired from Rutgers University in 2002. His paper-based works revisit themes from his Lynch Fragments, which is an ongoing series of small-scale reliefs born out of the social and political turmoil of the civil rights movement. By incorporating tools and other familiar objects, such as chains, locks, and axe heads, these pieces are abstract yet evocative, summoning a range of artistic, cultural, and historical references. Typically, the objects have destructive as well as creative associations. Transformed by the paper making blowout process, the forms continue to be recognizable as tools of power and of force. New York based artist John Kessler critiques our image obsessed surveillance dominated world. His chaotic kinetic installations combine mechanical know how with kitschy materials and images. Structurally complex and narratively engaging, his multimedia sculptures often deliver an emotional punch beyond their humble means by tapping into our all too real modern day anxieties, which are also quite evidenced in his paper works. Born in Japan of biracial ancestry, Saya Wolfhawk now lives in New York. Her multimedia works explore cultural hybridity, science, race, and sex. She believes symbolic and ideological systems can be activated and reimagined through collaboration, imaginative play, and masquerade. This project, the Institute of Empathy, is a mixed media installation that features a fictional group of women called the Emphatics, who can alter their genetic makeup and fuse with plants. New York artist Natalie Frank explores themes of power, sexuality, gender, feminism, and identity. Although best known as a painter, she has also explored other mediums, including sculpture, drawing, and handmade paper. Her most notorious works examine the original unsanitized fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. And Richard Tuttle is an American post-minimalist artist known for his small, subtle, intimate works. Um, eluding historical or stylistic categorization, his work exists in a space between painting, sculpture, assemblage, and drawing. Incorporating humble materials of all kinds, including paper pulp, the artist reflects upon the fragility of the world in his curiously poetic works. As seen here, many artists seek the haptic inherent in the art of hand paper making as a counterpoint to the prevalent interface of technology in our lives. By transforming this humble material into poignant critiques on contemporary culture, the works in Pulped Under Pressure do no less. In her catalog essay, Ashley Kissler expressed it beautifully for us. The versatile but labor intensive activity of making paper by hand as the seven artists in Pulped Under Pressure know all too well, begins with wet pulp that is stirred, formed, drained, and then pressed to remove excess water from the fibers before drying the finished product. While the word pressure in the exhibition's title recalls this penultimate step, more importantly, it alludes to the ways in which these practitioners adopt hand paper making con to convey pressing concerns beyond functional considerations. Often using this medium as an activist tool for social engagement, in their art process itself has inherent value launched as it is by purposeful decisions to reuse unwanted scrap material or to maximize artist grown fibers and dyes, which bring into play environmental issues such as sustainability, plant stewardship, and biological diversity. Process also accrues meaning through its connection to the cultural context of traditional handicraft that, when highlighted here, foreground foregrounds overlooked narratives focused on women and their undervalued labor. The artists in this exhibition physically embed traces of the histories and the fibers of their work and in so doing bolster the central role of paper to record and to preserve. At this time, we would be happy to answer any questions people have from the audience. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Melissa and Rennie. Just a reminder to everyone in the audience, um, please do feel free to utilize the um, question and answer box. Um, I did have a quick question um, for both of you. Um, 
But first, I, I do want to say thank you for the um, for bringing USM this exhibition. I feel it really links the two of our campuses. And there's so much power in having artwork both in a gallery as well as in a library. As a research institution, the library is really um, sort of the beating drum that our students utilize. And I think it's so important for students to encounter art within a research setting. It helps them to not only de-stress, but to simulate divergent thinking. Um, which is relevant across so many disciplines. Uh, my question is that with paper so often utilized as a substrate, what meaning do you find in paper being embedded from its creation with conceptual weight? Yeah, that's a great question. Renny, do you want me to tackle that one first? Yeah, go ahead. You start. Well, it's actually, it goes right back to the Center for Book and Paper. So it took me a long time, really decades, to... Um, get away from this idea of the paper as a substrate and to really build the metaphor of the material. And um, one of the ways that that happened for me was to think about papermaking as adjacent to textile and fiber media. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of schools across the country that have papermaking. Well, there aren't a lot. There are some because papermaking actually still isn't that um, usual. But uh, these, uh, there are many programs that have hand paper making adjacent to craft textiles. And it was through really thinking about it that way that I changed my teaching to uh, look at the ways it interplays with artist books and print, but also as sculptural object, uh, speaking about the long traditions of crafts media um, internationally. So, um, I think that answers hopefully a little bit about, you know, sort of building the metaphor. And I mean, one of the things that's always um, been interesting to me is that sometimes in uh, printmaking, the um, conversation between paper and the print on top of it can be quite binary. Um, and so what I noticed is when I, when I, uh, when I, incorporated more sculpture, even the printmakers started upping their game a little bit in terms of building metaphor in the work. Mm -hmm. And I've always just been very invested in materials, um, whether it's paint or or mixed media or found object or paper pulp, and you know, really recognizing the unique um, components of each material and trying to give them more um, meaning when they're combined with other things. So sort of upping the ante of what, what it might mean um, by adding it, may, make it add up to something more than each of the individual parts. Yeah, it's so, you know, I think I gathered that from all the writing on the exhibition and whatnot of um, the relationship between fiber and paper is really foregrounded here. In fact, when I've been speaking to students about this show, I've been usually saying, I think of it as a fiber show. And typically we might think of fiber work as being tapestry or woven, which there is some of in the show, but really these artists take fiber as their medium and wet fiber specifically or pulp. Um, so I try to start the conversation there. Um, so I'm I'm glad to hear we're all <laughs> sort yeah, of on the same Melissa, you might address your, your woven paper piece a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, I've really been um, interested in the evolution of contemporary craft and the ways that it intersects with so many conversations around um, traumatic healing and micro industry. I mean, it, there's so many conversations. Also, I'm particularly interested in the intersecting um, endangerments of plants in climate crisis and women's craft practices working with those plants. Um, so I've been doing a lot of mashup work, you know, like trying to force pretty much force um, paper into doing things that it wasn't normally meant to do, which is um, rather than spinning the plant fiber from its original material, making paper from it, and then spinning the paper and then making it into weavings again, sort of again, playing around with this idea of um, woven uh, textile practice with the same materials that handmade paper is made from. And also thinking about the ways that the rise of um, scholarly uh, endeavor throughout hum human history um, was also about the subjugation of the female narrative. And so also trying to invoke paper as a way to animate ancient languages that are embedded in textile craft that aren't necessarily about words, but are still very much a spoken or um, symbolic language. 
Mm -hmm. but paper is, you know, and this is where I started with the paper cutting. Um, it's a very democratic or de very accessible, you know, to almost everyone. It's relatively affordable, you know, when in the big scheme of things compared to other materials. And so the fact that, you know, women had access to, you know, paper and fiber, you know, to express themselves maybe long before they had, you know, access to the art system. I, I really appreciate the way the exhibition explores that relationship between femininity, femininity and craft through so many different um, uh, entry points across the works. I was also wondering, um, of, about what contemporary developments in paper making do you both feel most excited about? Or if none, um, what historical processes do you feel hold particular resonance today? Yeah, it's a really nice question. I mean, um, well, so when COVID hit, I started, I started getting asked to teach a lot and I designed this class for the MA in critical craft, um, which is at Warren Wilson College with the brilliant Namita Gupta Wiggers, uh, the, the director of that program, um, pandemic paper making. And, you know, it was sort of thinking about, well, first of all, I scaled it down into like no materials and no equipment, which I actually kind of accomplished. And it was pretty funny, but thinking about um, the ways, the ways that uh, uh, just some simple tools could bring you into contact with something um, and rethink something so ubiquitous as paper, right? I definitely think uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about climate change in abstract, and now we know rubber's really hitting road. And I think it's pretty interesting in all my paper making posse out in the universe. And by the way, I have a couple of them on the call today, and I'm truly, truly grateful. They're my sisters in, in arms across the, the world making paper and, and fiber arts. Um, I don't think it's an accident that my um, dance card is getting fuller right now because I think people are understanding that connection and how paper has the capacity to um, bring us into real contact with something with these critical conversations. I, I must say that Mel is is the genius of paper makers, you know, and I'm just you know long long for the ride. <laughs> You know? I mean, but this is the thing that makes collaboration the greatest feminist practice there is. You can't see yourself, doesn't matter how good you do any of your work, you can't see it objectively. So the beauty of working with other people is you mirror and reflect one another and that animation feeds each other. And, and so I think that's also what's so, for me, so magical about the paper making studio is someone has an idea and then another person responds to that idea and you go back to the idea and then you have another idea. It's a real, again, it's like a mirroring process. So I think it's, I don't, you know, I think that we animate one another in, in studios that work in craft through material. You also can't necessarily replicate something you've already done. So, I mean, I had the opportunity to go back a second time to the paper studio and I thought, well, let's just do more of what we did the first time. Well, it didn't work at all. So we had to come up with another way of approaching um, what I was going to generate. And I mean, it all worked out great, but, you know, it wasn't any, none of it was ever what I expected. So I went in not knowing what to expect and came out very happy. With well, and I love stuff. printmaking and Rennie did a lot of printmaking and that was the department where I met, you know, Rennie was in painting printmaking. I really spent most of my time like in litho and printmaking media, but what I found um, was it's both enraging and um, continually inspirational. Paper, make, paper doesn't behave itself. Like it's <laughs> always changing. And now the material itself is changing in climate change. So whatever recipe I might've had 10 years ago might not be the same recipe for plants that I'm pulling out of a garden that has completely different soil and water levels than it did 10 years ago. And that's part of what I think makes it such a dynamic fascinating process is its mercurial, ever-changing nature. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, it's not a question, but maybe a, a comment from uh, Rebecca uh, Onkener. Um, they say, what fascinates me about this medium is how direct, how, is how directly it interacts with tr the true transience of life. 
I'm thinking of Andy Goldsworthy's most recent art. I have to confess, I'm not familiar with his most recent endeavors, um, but I, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that comment, Melissa or Benny. I mean, uh, paper is a plant, it's, well, it's a seed to material process. So um, it is by nature, at least to some degree, biodegradable. Um, and it also incorporates the materials of our lives, the things that we're dependent on, um, food, soil, water. And so it's, uh, I think that it does have an intimate um, connection to, you know, processes of sort of body and decomposition and fragilities. And I think those are also some of the same reasons that it has not been invited to the her hero club of um, <laughs> contemporary art making. And, you know, I think there's, it's, it's not an accident. There's also a growing uh, conversation on death and on the transience of our existence in the face of climate, you know, climate change and the interdependencies. So I think um, paper, of course, is a really great metaphor. I was at a conversation recently on the prairie with a, um, a Navajo, um, and he, he's a, an, he was an artist, is an artist, and he called water blood and I was like, you know, I'm always thinking about plants and I have recently started thinking more about water and its relationship. And I thought, wow, talk about changing your relationship to something overnight. Water is the blood of the earth. And so even as I washed my hands the next morning, I thought, you know, just fundamentally changes it. And water is the elixir of paper. It's the, it's the scientific magic that creates the sheet. And so I thought that was a very interesting way to think about the materiality of hand paper making too. Yeah, I mean, I think paper has um, a lot of um, uh, dualities built into it, you know, so it's, it's fragile, you know, like M Melissa said, it's biodegradable, but it's also very resilient and um, receptive to manipulation. And um, so it can be a, a great metaphor for, you know, that cycle and that, that balance between, you know, um, things that degrade and things that survive. So um, I like working with paper. I don't always work with paper, but um, I make things that um, sort of defy um, what they should be, you know, in terms of their scale and, you know, cut, you know, and it's like, everyone's afraid to handle them and you know it's tricky because you don't want them to rip but you know once they're on the wall they they really almost look architectural so I mean right now I'm working on um handmade paper for a book project that I have on women um laborers in the in the south side but this is burdock and it was grown in a garden here um that I planted last year and um, it was uh, a wonderful nightmare, but also the color, like this beautiful green color, all of those things, the sort of fiber nature of it, uh, you don't know what it's gonna be like until you do it. And that, that, I know that was Rennie's experience in the studio. You just don't know. You can lay a great um, foundation and plan, but it may be something magically different. And it's usually in a very exciting way, magically different. Sometimes it's a disaster, but not usually. You can salvage it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that brings me to another question I had. In this exhibition, there are so many interesting hanging mechanisms. Um, not all the pieces are very straightforward in the way that they are displayed. And especially, I, I feel in lots of paper making endeavors, the artists place so much emphasis on a direct relationship between the viewer and the work, um, you know, be that through creating such intricacy that draws you in, like in your pieces, Renny, or perhaps allowing that work to exist without a frame or without a glaze between you and it, allowing that edge to sort of exist on the wall. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the importance of display when it comes to paper making and how viewers encounter the work. That is Renny genius. So I'm letting her take this one. Oh, I just think it's really important, you know, like with um, Marilyn's work, um, Notes from the Sea, they wouldn't have worked at all under glass. You know, she really 
wanted them to feel like they were floating in in the water and you know everything goes back to to that that idea of the ephemeral and and the longevity you know so she even painted the little magnets to match the the color of the print that you know so you want they disappear and very very carefully created you know installation instructions based on every artist's wishes um so that they would convey you know the original intent of the work yeah um, but rennie designs a lot of our hanging systems so i think one of the things that's interesting is you know when you work as hard as you do to make a piece of handmade paper artwork sometimes you just i don't have the juice to like think about a hanging system and rennie has designed unbelievable hanging systems that bring things out from the wall that actually my pieces like the framing on that i was like are you crazy I'm not going to frame those, you know, and she can't, she worked with a framer to figure out how to like make it work and still be, you know, a framed work that was animated, um, all kinds of brilliant hanging devices. So Rennie, I feel like Rennie is pretty singularly responsible for that in this exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. But I, you know, just listening to what the artists want, you know. <laughs> And magnets. Magnets are your friend. <laughs> yeah, and floaters. <laughs> and floaters and little stands. And yeah. Yeah. You just have to be um in tune to the nuance of the work and figure out a way not to compromise that. Um, I do have one quick question um before we close from um Milka Basel. I teach paper making as well, and I am noticing a real hunger to know and think about materials slash source in my students. Have you found an increase in these interests over time as well? What do you think this niche practice of paper making has to say to contemporary art going forward? Yeah, um, Milka is somebody I follow um, and uh, admire very much. So it's great to see you here tonight. Um, I mean, I think it's so exciting the way the practices of people like Milka are inspiring students because it is really a niche. It's a very niche thing. So I think artists are very inspired by contemporary artists making work in hand paper making. Um, definite, we have always had hand paper. I mean, for as long as I've been at my institution, we have hand paper making. So there's sort of a little bit of a cult following behind it. Um, but as soon as we tell people about it, yeah, they go nuts. And I think that um, it's for every action equal and opposite, right? So like when you're behind Zoom for two years, of course, you're going to want to go like cover yourself in mud and roll around with stinky paper pulp. <laughs> and the students love every, you know, they love that about it. Um, and what do I think it has to say about contemporary art making practice? Um, well, I mean, I'm interested in very particular things, which is that it is a traditionally male um, skill, which has been translated into a woman dominated craft. So I'm really interested in the intersections of feminist care ethics and, and feminist histories and hand paper making. And that's where I do a lot of my scholarship. Maybe Rennie has some additional thoughts about paper and its relationship to contemporary art practice. Well, I, I wasn't going to say necessarily just paper, but I think anything that invests um, the art maker in the actual making that they're actually hang, hanging on to something or touching something or manipulating something by hand has has definitely there's been uh, just a, a great desire for students to do that. Um, it, it might be like through encaustic or or or, you know, anything that, you know, has a real strong sort of sensual sensuality about it. Um, paper, definitely handmade paper being one of those things. But I do think it comes out of some of what Mel says, but also just this sort of distancing that we've all been subjected to through this screen and you know coming out of COVID. But it was prior to COVID as well. You know, I mean, students, artists want want to be doing want the skill or the the, act, the uh, opportunity to actually touch their material <laughs> it's as simple as that you know so it's very satisfying to work with your hands it's also very calming it's you know and that's what a lot of my work is process that is tedious but you know in some ways but it's very slow and meditative in other ways and so it helps keep me calm. I'm hoping that translates to the person looking at it as well, you know. 
I'm teaching a class now called Crap Culture and History, and I'm really excited by the emerging scholarship in this area that intersects with um, race, class, and gender, because that is the history of craft and fine art. You know, when you look at them as two um, side by side things, also the um, histories in this country of um, craft and slavery and the reconstruction and globally questions around micro industry and traditional culture. So, I mean, I, I think to answer the question too about contemporary art, I think give it another five years and there's gonna be a really, really strong argument, not just for the um, equality of craft like hand paper making to fine art, but also for its necessity in having a really robust conversation around why we make and what we do and how it's related to history. I so appreciate that as a note for us to end on. I mean, this exhibition really takes such an interesting look at these like intersections between culture and identity and history, craft, femininity. Um, is It really holds so much potential, I think, for our students to come at it from so many different perspectives. Uh, I want to thank both of you for your time tonight, Melissa and Rennie. Um, we're just so thrilled to have this exhibition connecting our two campuses. And I would like to invite everyone to the show who's on this call if you haven't yet been. Um, I'm also going to mention that we're going to have yoga in the gallery alongside the works on November 9th um, at 6 p.m. It's an excellent opportunity to experience the show alongside some slow meditative looking facilitated by the workout. Um, so I hope to welcome you soon if I haven't already. And thank you so much for joining us. I hope everyone has a great evening. Yes, well, thank, thank you so you much, Pat. Thank you. All right. Bye, bye, all. Bye.